a photographer that has always wanted to try astrophotography, but you weren't so sure about investing hundreds or even thousands of dollars into a hobby before you knew if it was for you? Well, then watch this video because I'm gonna show you how you can capture and process a photo of the Orion Nebula with gear you might already have. For this tutorial, I'm just gonna be using five pieces of gear, a DSLR, a lens, a tripod, an inexpensive intervalometer, and this last one is optional. This is a cheap bot-to-dog mask. Hey, if you're new to my channel, welcome. My name is Nico Carver. I'm a deep sky astrophotographer and my website is nebulaphotos.com. With this channel, I just wanna share my love of astrophotography and especially help newcomers to the hobby get started. Um, and I'll also just mention really briefly here at the start that I do have a Patreon. Thanks so much to everyone who already supports me. Um, it really keeps the channel uh, going at a steady pace. If you're interested, my Patreon starts at just $1 a month. Today, I'm gonna show you how you can capture deep sky objects, meaning objects out in space that are outside of our solar system. This tutorial will work for many different deep sky objects. I'm gonna be shooting the constellation Orion, which is setting in the west right now. And we should be able to see after processing the Orion Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula, and the Flame Nebula. And we're gonna do it with just five pieces of equipment. A stock DSLR, a fast lens, a tripod, an intervalometer, and a bod nut mask. If you've seen my most popular video series, it's called Orion Nebula Start to Finish. This is gonna be somewhat similar to that with a little bit of overlap but the technique and the processing will be different since we're not gonna be using a tracker or a telescope as I did in that video series. For those new to astrophotography, what a star tracker does, or when they get a little bit bigger, they're called a mount, an astrophotography mount. Um, what it does is it moves your camera at a constant rate. That rate is called the sidereal rate. So it has a little motor in here with gears and then it just moves everything on top, called the payload, at the sidereal rate. And that rate, what it is, is it's the rate that the stars seem to move across the sky from our vantage point here on Earth. And you can keep time to it, just like we normally keep time with the solar rate. Um, of course, it's not really the stars moving. They're so far away from us that they're practically fixed. It's really that the Earth is rotating very fast around its axis called the celestial pole. And that's why the stars are seeming to move across the sky. So another way to think of a star tracker or a mount is the device to counteract Earth's rotation. So Earth's rotating this way, the star tracker is gonna move in the opposite way at that sidereal rate. And what that allows you to do is take long exposures of the night sky and have sharp stars and uh, bring out those DSOs, uh, deep sky objects, through long exposure. But they'll remain nice and sharp because you don't get the, the motion blur from Earth's rotation with the star tracker. But today, we're not gonna use the star tracker or a telescope because I wanna show everyone out there that you can start doing deep sky astrophotography with gear that's really more just common photography gear, gear you might already have, at least a lot of it. And I'm gonna repeat this a lot, your gear does not have to be the same as mine to follow along with this video. As long as you have some kind of camera that can do some you know, manual exposure control, you have some kind of lens. Be better if it can shoot f4 or faster. A tripod, and you have some way of taking many exposures without having to touch the camera each time. Then you have everything you need for this tutorial. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about each piece of equipment that I'll be using tonight. And we'll start with the tripod. First thing I'm gonna say, if you already have a tripod, use the tripod you have. 
For your first time trying Esther Photography, there's no need to upgrade anything that you already have. That being said, the sturdier the tripod, the better. Um, I'm a big fan of Monfrotto tripod legs. These are uh, aluminum Monfrotto tripod legs that are probably 15 years old. I'm sure that I bought it used because I just trust in Monfrotto's quality. They have held up really well. Um, all their stuff works really well. Um, but the sturdiness comment and the, the reliability also goes for the tripod head. Um, you want to use the biggest, sturdiest tripod head you have. And for me right now, that's this video head. It's not designed for astrophotography, but it's just, it has a nice big platform for holding the camera. I know for a fact that when I lock down the tilt or the pan, that those stay in place and can hold a lot of weight. So with the tripod head, bigger the better. Uh, if it's a ball head, just make sure that it really stays stable. Okay, next piece of equipment is the DSLR. This is an eight-year-old camera. It's my Canon 5D Mark III that I bought the year it came out. Um, it's a very nice full-frame camera, but that really doesn't matter. Just use whatever you have. Um, I've repeated this a number of times now, and the reason is I've often heard people remark, well, I'd like to do astrophotography, but my gear isn't good enough. My camera is not good enough. It's not true. If you have a camera that can, you can manually control the exposure, um, you can do this. Um, one other aspect that's really handy and we're gonna be using in this tutorial is you want your camera to be able to controlled with an intervalometer. So almost any DSLR that you have will, will do this. Um, just uh, you, if you don't already have one, you might have to look up what kind of intervalometer uh, you might want to get. Um, they look like this. And what it is, is it allows you to take many shots. So uh, I've tried a bunch of different models. I have a fancy wireless one. So the way the wireless one works is the controller is this thing. And then it has a little receiver that goes on top of the camera and plugs in. And then I can control uh, from, I don't know, something like 30 meters away or something like that. Uh, it's handy, but not necessary. It's a little bit more expensive to get a wireless one. A wired one works just fine. This is the newer uh, model. I think it's about 30 bucks. And they all basically work the same way. So just get whichever one is uh, designed for your camera. For people that are new to this device, all it does is it allows you to trigger the shutter. So normally we just hit the shutter button on top of the camera but without touching the camera physically. And the reason that we want to do this is we're taking a long exposure. We don't want to add any vibration shake by touching the camera when we take that exposure. So we can just hit the shutter button right there to take the exposures. Um, but what an intervalometer does, in addition to just being able to take um, a, sh a single exposure like that, is to take a sequence of exposures. So what the camera will do is it'll take hundreds of exposures in a row, and the way you do that, all you have to do is program in the sequence right here and press start. So really easy, I'm gonna show you how to use it. If you are still on the fence about buying one of these, if you don't already have one, it's about 30 bucks. Keep in mind that these are also super useful for time-lapse photography. But if you're not into time-lapse, you're also a real cheapskate and you really don't want to spend the 30 bucks, then what I'd recommend instead is just a shutter release cable. So it looks sort of like the intervalometer, except it's smaller and all it has is the little external cable release. Um, these go for as low as like 10 bucks. Um, so the downside to this, of course, is you can't program that sequence. So what you're gonna have to do is just get out there and sit in a chair next to your tripod and be careful not to move and just take hundreds of exposures hitting the button each time manually. Okay, so it's another option. I don't recommend it though. Oh, last thing I'll say about intervalometers, 
Canon is a bit weird. They've never put an intervalometer into the actual firmware of the camera, to my knowledge. Maybe in some of their really newer cameras. I haven't followed it too closely, so don't quote me on that. But a lot of camera manufacturers have been doing it for years. And so read your manual or Google it because you may find out your camera already has a built-in intervalometer. So you don't actually need to spend any money on this. You can just program it right in your camera and have it rip through a sequence of exposures without you touching anything. Next up we have the lens and I'll be using this lens. This is a lens that I bought for filmmaking. Um, it's called the Rokinon Cine 1.5. The optics are the exact same as the Rokinon 85mm f1.4, just so you're aware. Again, use whatever lens you have, even if that's your kit lens that came with your camera, use it. Um, if you do have a choice of lenses though, uh, I would recommend a lens with a focal length of at least, let's say 50 millimeters, and one that can shoot faster than f4. So what I mean by faster is the number will be smaller because remember uh, focal ratio is a division so f2 is faster than f4 because the aperture is actually bigger because uh, one half is bigger than one fourth, right? Um, for astrophotography you really just want that focal ratio to be faster so you let in more light, more signal uh, with each exposure. Also for astrophotography, as a general rule of thumb, prime lenses like this one, where they just have a fixed focal length, so this is just an 85 millimeter lens, will perform better than zoom lenses where they have a range of focal lengths, like a 70 to 200 millimeters. 